and time for our first speaker. Uh, he's been described as the Michael Moore of the right. Uh, he's a TV producer and a, a documentary film director, uh, and he's also the founder and CEO of WAG TV, which produces shows for various US and international broadcasters. Uh, his films include the brilliant Margaret Death of Re Revolutionary, brilliant wasn't in the title, I'm describing it as brilliant, uh, Britain's uh, brilliant trillion pound horror uh, story, uh, and Nigel Farage, who are you? Good question. Uh, he just made the feature length documentary Brexit the Movie, guess what that's about, uh, which aims to show that Britain should vote to leave the EU uh, and that we thrive outside it. So to tell us more, please welcome Martin Durkin. <laughs> Um, sadly, I haven't been to the movie yet, which is why um, the speech isn't as prepared as it might have been otherwise, because I'm still in the early, and in fact we're still filming, plenty of so it's, uh, I'm, I'm not having my mini nervous breakdown at the film at the moment. But um, Ralph insisted that we uh, uh, show you a little bit. Uh, in fact, this isn't part of the film, it's just a few uh, sink bites, sink pulls. That we, uh, that we call it the trade, that we did very hastily this afternoon. So please forgive the roughness of it, but it will give you a rough little taste for the, some of the things that some of the people we're talking to um, are saying. And if it works, here it goes. I think the EU is a profoundly anti-democratic organisation. It was devised to make sure that the great mass of the people could not control government ever again. Do you know who this man is? No. No? No. no. A democracy only works if you know who your representatives are. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, see. Martin. 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 The expression I really hate is pooled sovereignty. It's bollocks. Who is this man? Oh, the people say always he likes to drink too much, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that too. The people of Slovenia have no more idea than the people of the UK and the people of Sweden, or the people of Spain, what in fact is going on. Would it help if you knew who they were? Because you don't have any power over them, so what's the point? I just hope that the mass of people who may not go around being interviewed much, may never get a look in on any of the media or television, come June the 23rd will be out there saying, this is our chance to get our own back. It comes down to the essential issue. The working man and woman of this country against people who think we have a better plan and a better mind than you. And if you don't like it, what are you going to do? And the answer is, we're going to vote leave. So... If I was told I would be stewing grass to feed my family in five years' time, if we left the European Union, I would still do it. Many years ago, uh, when I was a wee lad, I remember working at the GLC, um, back in the 80s when Margaret Thatcher decided to abolish it. And I remember the arrogance of the uh, bureaucratic and political class at the GLC. Um, and I always wondered, I'm saying, this could be a disaster. I mean, this will certainly blow up in Margaret Thatcher's face. Gosh, she's stepped on a landmine here, because tomorrow morning when the GLC no longer exists, so is this working? Um, if, I mean, London was going to be in flames. The bosses weren't going to work. Nothing was going. But we woke up the next morning, and what do you know? The GLC had gone, and it was all very jolly London. Peter Lilly, I was talking to, uh, uh, we were interviewing for the film, and he was uh, remembering talking to someone from Czechoslovakia, who was in charge of dismantling the country. He said, "God, that must have been hard. I mean, a whole country. How do you kind of take that? Apart? So how long did that take?" He said, "It was a weekend." <laughs> <laughs> I thought, how the arrogance, how do we, part of the arrogance is, of course, the idea that all of us should be regulated by them. In fact, I'm related to quite a lot of civil service bureaucrats, so I have a particular uh, sort of um, uh, uh, angry feelings about this. But nevertheless, I wanted to show this in the film, the degree of the regulation of our lives. Could we talk about EU regulation, but how do you illustrate it? And it was great film with uh, Will Ferrell, where he was autistic and he's sort of getting up and there's numbers coming up everywhere because he sees the world in numbers and I thought this would be a really good way of, of doing how our lives are regulated. I can be getting up in the morning and brushing teeth and all that sort of thing and I bet there's an EU law for pretty much every object in the room, every object that I come across, there'll be a bit of, a bit of legislation, an actual law. And I was wrong. There was more than one 
<laughs> so in the pillowcase we started, there are five EU laws pretending to pillowcases. Twelve for the duvet. I don't know why duvets are so incredibly dangerous or whatever, but they need twelve laws. Bed linen, forty. There are forty EU laws pretending to bed linen. The alarm clock, 172. Bathroom scales, where this calms down a bit when you go to the bathroom because there's only 28. Toothbrush, 31. Toothpaste, 56. The shower, fucking lethal. 127 <laughs> words <laughs> pertaining to the shower. It's obviously really dodgy. The toaster, not so bad because there's only 56 laws pertaining to toasters, but whatever you do, don't burn the toast because that brings in the smoke alarm in the bin, which pushes it up to 621. <laughs> um, don't, whatever you do, open the fridge because that's 1,490 EU laws. Uh, and don't have a bowl of cereal, cereal that's 243. The spoon is 220. And my favourite, the dog. 599. So the Articles of Association for the um, European, uh, the economic, the, the coal and steel organization, as was, was 30 pages long. But as we were going through the archive, uh, Ted Heath signing the, uh, uh, signing the document for, the, for signing up to the EU, I noticed something which I hadn't understood, but suddenly it clicked. They were wheeling on a pile of paper that high with a ribbon round from the floor, and uh, that was how it had grown by the time of us joining to that. That was just the Articles of Association, that's not all the other governments. And the reaction of the audience was quite strange. Well, they, they laughed and clapped as if it was, it was really good that we've got so many <laughs> complex articles. But in fact, as we show in the film, they've grown since then, that now that same document would reach as high as Nelson's column. Oh, <laughs> um, now, we know the results of regulation because, oh well, those of us who know anything about post-war Britain know the results of regulation because we know what happens when Stafford Cripps and others decide that the entire economy needs to come under the uh, control of the political bureaucratic class. It's a complete, utter economic disaster. What we do in the film is look at actually the, the twin stories of, of Germany and the UK. Because Germany has Ludwig Erhard. Uh, uh, taking over as Ministry for the Economy, where he stays for the uh, best part of two decades. Uh, he'd been in the anti-Nazi resistance, and he was an, a, 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 a rabid classical liberal, if you can have rabid classical liberals. Um, and he, there was the bonfire of regulations in Germany. They, uh, he, did, in his words, declared war on regulators and regulations, ripped them up like anything, and, they, and he said, the quid pro quo is, Big companies could expect no protection whatsoever from international free trade. It would be exposed to the, the, the cruelest competition internationally, and we all know the, the result. And it shouldn't have been that way, oddly enough. Um, at the end of the Second World War, Britain was by far the biggest, most powerful, strongest industrial power in Europe. We were producing 60% of Europe's cars. But what happens is the result of regulation versus not regulation. So what would happen if we left? We go and we have a little look at Switzerland, which don't seem to be doing, uh, Switzerland doesn't seem to be doing too badly, uh, not in the EU. Uh, they have a population export five times more than us. They are uh, twice as wealthy. Um, income distribution is, is remarkably equal for a, an advanced country. It's like the EU upside down Switzerland because the people have enormous power and politicians and, and, and bureaucracy has very little indeed. And in fact, the results of that are extraordinarily impressive. Um, but one little example that sort of came along the way which tickled me was that uh, uh, Belgium, which does not have its own currency, has a central bank which employs 14,000 people, whereas Switzerland, which has one of the most successful currencies in the world, has a central bank that employs 800 people. Um, and of course the Remainers say, well it took, oh yeah, but you know Switzerland, it took 12 years to negotiate a trade deal uh, with the EU, which is wrong, and I was thinking, a hard one to count on what I say. And then I realized that in those 12 years, was it possible, <laughs> was it difficult to buy a Rolex or a Swatch or a jar of Nescafe or in fact anything else that the Swiss produced? Despite all that time without a trade deal within the, uh, 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 within the EU, they were still exporting to the EU more by the population than we were. Indeed, the, by market capitalization, the three biggest companies in Europe, Novartis, uh, Roche, and Nestle, aren't even in the EU. They are very merrily Swiss. Um, and indeed, when it comes to trade deals, um, Germany's main export market is the US, which they don't have a trade deal with. And indeed, you know, we don't have a trade deal with uh, America or Japan, but you know, have you ever heard of Apple or 
uh, Kellogg's or a million other um, US firms that have sold their products primarily and have done over here, uh, or indeed Japan, I mean, Sony TVs or Pentaxes, all the rest of it. Trade deals, again, are this the political bureaucratic class of what you really need in order to get on. Uh, Mandelson, Peter Mandelson, um, uh, the other day on the, I'm sure we all heard him on the Today programme, I'm sure we all listened to the Today programme for us since. Um, we're saying that we can't possibly leave the EU because we're too small. We're too small to uh, negotiate our own way in the world. You need a big fellow like the EU behind you, really, in order to get the trade deals that you need. And so for a bit of fun, we looked at um, the trade deals that other countries have. Um, now, the EU tra trade deals, if you count up the GDP of the countries that the EU have trade deals with, it comes to a glorious $8 trillion, which is impressive. Singapore has trade deals with countries whose GDP add up to 39 trillion. Korea, little Korea, um, they have trade deals with uh, countries with combined GDP of 40 trillion, five times that amount of the EU. Chile, um, they have trade deals of 58 trillion, more than seven times the number of the EU. And in case you say, oh, well, that doesn't include uh, the EU itself, even if you include the EU within that number, they still only have a a kind of trade deal footprint of 24 trillion, uh, which is, you know, what's that? A lot less than half of Chile's. So essentially, the rule is if you really want to avoid trade deals, join the EU. <laughs> um, One the, minute warning. I'm going to warn you. Well, I'm going to warn about influence. We know about influence. If we had any influence, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have had the, 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 the ridiculous charade of the negotiations we had with David Cameron. We can't even get a minor temporary change to our welfare legislation past the EU. And as for EU influence, can you imagine Obama thinking, oh no, Donald Tusk is coming in half, how about I change my shirt? Um, <laughs> do we want to submit to the authority of, uh, of an institution run by people we don't know, a system we don't understand, passing laws that we have little or no chance of overturning? As far as I can see, that uh, our democratic rights are not something that we should be trading for lower mobile phone charges or indeed anything else. Thank you.